us your thought on the state of America right now. Well, the state of America sort of goes up and down depending on what I call pressure events that happen in American life. And it tends to show itself in terms of uh, a uh, reaction from the black community, uh, which is built not only around the event, in this case, the tragic death of George Floyd, but built around uh, frustrations and a little bit of bitterness and anger at some of the factors that separate them from the American dream in this country. And when you get that kind of uh, mix of events, attitudes, and problems, you have what we have here with in Minneapolis and around the country. And I think the same thing happened in Detroit when you had the Detroit riots, which led to the Kerner Commission report, which said unequivocally that we are living in two nations, uh, black and white, separate and unequal. So that's some 50 plus years ago. And you go to Ferguson when Mike Brown was, was, was killed. Uh, these things happen not just because of the event of a tragic death, but because there is a brewing frustration among African Americans that they are not living the full extent of, this, of the American dream. Now, you're calling for $14 trillion in reparations to the black community. Walk us through your thought process on that number and what that would solve. Yeah, let me deal with the thought process on the number. If you take uh, from African-American slavery through Jim Crowism, through segregation, both de jure and de facto, and by the denial of certain economic and equal rights, it led to a chasm of economic inequality. And that inequality came about because wealth transfers took place from African-American slaves, no payment for labor, to white owners of plantation farms and otherwise, who then used that money to, to uh, make additional wealth in, in, throughout the country. You had another transfer when African Americans were denied equal education opportunities. Remember when we had separate and equal in education? Again, education being a path to wealth. You add to another wealth transfer when you take into account the home ownership uh, development in the U.S. Under the U.S. policy, people who own a home and have a mortgage can deduct their interest payment on the mortgage against their taxes. People who have to rent because they don't have the money to pay for a home and don't get the mortgage, they pay rent, but their taxes are taxed based on their income. So in effect, African-Americans are subsidizing white homeowners. That's why African-Americans are 40% homeowners, white Americans 70%. So you move forward till today, the net worth of a median African, a median white American family is $170,000. The net worth of a median African American family is $17,000. So you have a wealth gap. Reparations, in addition to atonement and, a policy, and apology, is a way to close the huge wealth gap between African Americans and white Americans. So that $14, million, $14 trillion dollars is an analysis that says if you can bring us equal in home ownership, equal in education, equal in income, equal in wealth and savings and investment, that number, when it brought when it's brought to equality, would have paid out in cash to over 40 million African Americans, would equal approximately 14 trillion dollars. And there is no reason to argue why African American wealth transfer was made under government influence, under segregation, and under racism. So what is the problem right. with paying people? And, and I did the math on the basis, let's say you paid over 30 years, it's about 11,000 per African-American soul in the United States. And I say to my white American friends, what is wrong with doing what people did in Germany after uh, World War II and the Nazi uh, horror? They paid reparations to Jews. The Turks, the Armenians are constantly calling for reparations against the Turks for attempted 
genocide. We pay reparations to uh, Japanese Americans who were in turn because of the war with Japan and the attack on Pearl Harbor. Reparations is not a new, right. new factor. And, and so to me, to white America, why not, instead of paying welfare, child support, uh, um, not child support, but uh, a child programs, and instead of paying uh, food stamps, instead of doing Section 8 low-income housing, that's money, it's coming out of the taxpayers, no doubt. Take that same amount of money, put it in the hands and cash of African Americans, and let us define and, and implement our own destiny using wealth much like every white American did in this country. I frankly don't see the issue of paying reparations. Plus, you get the, to black Americans, when white Americans say, we are sorry for what we did to you, that's a change in the heart of probably the most forgiving people in the world, black Americans. That has, to me, an emotional change and shift when Americans begin to see themselves right. as a capitalistic nation as equals. Meantime, as we've been speaking, President Obama has been speaking at a virtual town hall about racism. And to your point, he said the pandemic has exposed health care vulnerability, inequality, and also that these events are as profound as any he has seen in his lifetime. I do want to get your thoughts on what's happening on social media because so much of this photos, videos, uh, commentary is pouring out on, 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 on social media. You've got Twitter taking a stand against the president's remarks, Facebook letting them stand. Which company is making the right call here? Well, I think the, the key issue that Americans should understand that those two platforms are so dominant and so ubiquitous that they have the potential to change human attitudes and feelings and ideology. So with that goes some responsibility. But responsibility, if measured by where you stand, depends on where you sit, you can get the kind of coverage of the flow of information that's based on the people who control the platform. So to me, I take the position that if, if they keep going the way they're going, the government may declare them a common carrier or a public interest uh, uh, property, much the way they do broadcast because they use the public airways. So if you're going to look at one person and say, what you're saying is wrong, and I, and I not only say you're wrong, I pick the fact checkers to back me up. That raises a serious question. What happens when somebody you don't like may be in charge of that platform, and they pick what they think is right, and they hire the fact checkers to back you up? So I, I think both uh, Twitter and Facebook need to take a long, hard look at what they created and the monster they created in terms of business may come back to, to bite them in terms of just ideology about what is in the best interest of the American people. Meantime, I want to get your thoughts on what's happening in the entertainment industry. Blackout Tuesday, the hashtag was trending on social media earlier this week. You've got artists donating to the cause and they're calling on music labels to do the same because they say that the industry has profited so much off the, the backs uh, of black artists, if you will. How do you think the music and the entertainment industry in particular can make a change? Well, you, you're making the point I've been making all along is that African Americans have contributed mightily to the success of this country. Obviously, labor, uh, obviously going to war when you didn't have the rights here at home. Uh, fighting against Nazism, but coming back home and finding racism. So African Americans have paid their price to America. Now it's time for Americans to pay their price for African Americans. I know of so many artists who basically performed and wrote great music and copyrighted it, but lost all of that through contracts and controls that were put onto them by the record companies. And this is not new. And so when people say uh, Blackout Tuesday or we got to do something about the entertainment world, 
the entertainment world has the same kind of behavior in many ways as other businesses in America. Redlining is a bank problem, much like stealing music rights is a music problem. Denying people full education is a problem. Denying people equal justice under law is a problem. The question we keep going around is how do you solve it? And what I'll tell you, I am frankly tired of hearing politicians, in some cases black and white, engaging in platitudes about, oh, we must come together, we must sure everybody has justice, we're America, we're better than this. To me, that is akin to rearranging the deck chairs on a racial Titanic. These problems that we have will only be solved when African Americans and white Americans see each other as equals financially, opportunity-wise, and wealth creation. It will never be solved if African Americans are always behind white Americans in wealth. And if they're going to do, if you look at that way, African Americans could just say, we'll never be as wealthy, we'll never be as well off, we'll never have as much opportunity as white. So what do we want to do? Assign ourselves to being inferior? Well, if you do that, white Americans will say, well, the reason we treat you like this is because you decided you're inferior. My thing is, change that attitude. Give African Americans what the capitalist economy has given to everybody in this country. And much of what white America has came because of a huge financial wealth uh, transfer from black workers, right. slaves, to white plantation owners and beyond. 